Napoleon and Nelson, Instruments of Heaven. And so it's going to be a session that deals with some history, and I'll do my best to unravel that for you in relation to the wonderful prophecy that we have, of course, in the 16th chapter of the Apocalypse. And perhaps you could join me there in Revelation chapter 16, because as you are fully aware, what we have here is a very relevant prophecy to ourselves. Extremely relevant. Because we know, of course, from the <coughs> words of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 15, that it's towards the end of the sixth vile period that he will make his appearance. And he warns in that verse in parenthesis because it's actually him who has taken the pen from John's hand. John's the writer up to verse 14, the end thereof, and verse 16 onwards, but it's Christ who speaks the words of verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief, he says. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked. And they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So that's how relevant this prophecy is to us. We are right on the cusp of that. God willing, tomorrow night we'll talk to interested friends who may come along about just how close we are to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. No question about that whatsoever. And of course the events that are occurring in Egypt and Libya and other places like that are just one of many things that tell us that the day is at hand. Well, tonight I want to talk about history from the time of the French Revolution. And as you can see on the screen behind me, Revelation chapter 16 really begins in chapter 15 because that's the foundations of what we have here in the 16th chapter. The rejoicing redeemed of verses 1 to 4 and then the temple opened in heaven in verses 5 to 8 of the 15th chapter are all introductory of the work of these seven angels who pour out the vials of the wrath of God. And that work commences in chapter 16 verse 1 with the French Revolution, which of course we know has shaped the world in which we live today and the society in which we find ourselves as being fully marinated by the three unclean spirits that emanated from the French Revolution. Liberty, equality and fraternity. They have done an extremely destructive work in our society and we are being touched by that. And I'm very pleased actually that you've chosen as the study for the weekend uh, basically family life uh, in, in Christ. And we're going to have a look at the example of Abraham and Sarah and the aspects of, of leadership in the family and so on. And we're going to find that we have been affected. There's no question we've been affected by these three unclean spirits like frogs, which bring the nations to Armageddon, says verse 14 of this chapter. It's that spirit that brings the nations to Armageddon. And we're watching it right now in Egypt and Libya and elsewhere. So it's a very relevant study from that perspective alone. We're going to be focusing on that area that you can see there um, in the box upon the the second, third, fourth and fifth vials of the wrath of God which were poured out from the towards the, the end of the reign of terror uh, in the French Revolution 1793 uh, through to the abolition of the Holy Roman Empire in 1808. That's the area we want to talk about in relation to Napoleon and Nelson who are the two leading characters that play their part in the unfolding of this biblical historical period. Now there's a fundamental principle that when you come to look at any Bible prophecy, this is the principle that applies. Prophecy is the mould into which history is poured. It's not the other way around. Prophecy is not there to recount history because prophecy is about what's coming. Prophecy is what God says is going to happen. History records that that's what happened. So history is, is poured into the mould of prophecy. God speaks, the angels go forth, and it is done. We're going to see in the case of Napoleon and Nelson tonight that they were shaped, their destinies and their work was shaped by divine intervention. And there are clear indications of that, not only in what they did and what they survived, 
But in what was said about them, as we shall see, these two men that God used to further his purpose. You take this man, for example. He should have been riddled full of bullets in his early 20s. He should never have survived to become the emperor of France at age 30, which is ridiculous anyway when you think about it. When we talk about this man, he's a Corsican. He couldn't even speak decent French. And he becomes the emperor of the French at age 30. Now that is just almost, it's mind-boggling. But it came to pass. Why? Because God used this man as a vehicle to fulfil his purpose. And we're going to see that while Napoleon focused on that purpose, God was with him. When he got off the path of that purpose, the wheels fell off. And he was redirected. He had to go back to what God wanted him to achieve. So he's just one example. We're going to have a look at these men of destiny, Napoleon the General. By the way, did you notice the picture? It's almost like he had his own photographer there. Well, he didn't have cameras in those days, but in actual fact, you know, he did have his own photographer. Everywhere he went, he had a painter who came with him whose sole task was to paint these pictures. And there are literally thousands of them. Uh, of course, the, the steed on which he's riding looks like it came out of, you know, it's a perfect batch of, of uh, you know, Spanish, uh, you know, those apple, what do they call them? Uh, what are the horses' names are? Perfect specimen of those particular kind of horses. Well, of course, he wasn't riding that at all. He was actually riding a mule when, when this event happened. But, because he was crossing the Alps. But now the painter made sure, a bit like they do, they touch up pictures today, don't they? They make show awful pictures of politicians who are important, unless they want to embarrass them. That's what he was like. He did have his own photographer. And this gentleman, now, he wasn't really a gentleman, by the way, <coughs> Horatio Nelson. He was, in terms of even our standards, he was corrupt. I mean, he put away his wife and, and, and had a, he consorted with another woman, and, which was hideous in those days. We're going back to the 1700s here. It was just, it was frowned upon by society. So this man, from any perspective, should not have been chosen to do what he did. Why did God use him? Well, he used him because, of course, this man had talent in a certain direction, and we're going to see that tonight. He had talent and skill as an admiral, as a leader of men. And so God uses him until he's finished with him. At 47 years of age, he's gone. <laughs> and in the case of Napoleon, his career was over at 46. He's gone. So these two men came to the end of their careers, relatively young men, if I might say so, given my age. So... God used them until he was done with them, and then they were taken out of the way. Now, the first time that Nelson emerges, really, he had a, he had a reputation prior to this as a magnificent commander of vessels and of men. But the first time that he really made his mark on history was in the Battle <coughs> of the Nile. Now, what happened was that in 1798, in order to get Napoleon out of French politics, which is the reason why the Directory, as it was called then, sent him to Egypt on an expedition to conquer Egypt. And of course, Napoleon made the statement, he who rules Egypt rules the world. And we'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow night, God willing, because Gog is about to rule Egypt. It's the cruel lord of Isaiah 19, verse 4. And what we're seeing now is the preparation for Gog to come down into Egypt in terms of Daniel chapter 11, more about that later. But he made that statement, he who rules Egypt rules the world. And so they sent Napoleon there, given his uh, abilities in uh, leading men, and it was a disaster. Well, initially it was fine, he, he conquered Egypt, but then he tried to conquer Syria and it didn't work. And eventually he left behind 30,000 men to twiddle their thumbs while he made his way back to France and within a year he was in charge of France as a as a 30 year old now this is an incredible history when you look at it. but he was uh, he was disturbed by the intervention of Nelson at the battle of the Nile we're going to see of course uh, this this was a classic example of Nelson's ability now the battle of the Nile was not actually near the Nile it was over here in the in the, the bay, as you can see, of uh, Abu Kur in Egypt, which is not far from Alexandria. 
And uh, this was the, the scene that was painted of the battle. It was carnage. And the French fleet was chopped up well and truly. And this is how it happened. The Battle of the Nile was fought on the 1st and 2nd of August, 1798. And as you can see, we've got a line of ships here. This is the French fleet. And they're actually moored there. And we have another line of ships coming down here. This is the British fleet. You're going to see this in slightly more detail. Because what happened was that there's the line of French ships. At least to call these ships, ships of the line. And the reason for that is they fought in this line formation. They were vulnerable, of course. They didn't have motors on board in those days. It was all sail, and therefore you were wholly dependent on the direction of wind, and you didn't have any defence behind and before. So you, you stayed in line so that the, the ship in front of you could defend you to some degree from anyone coming in from the sides. Ships of the line. Now what Nelson did, he, he caught this French fleet of 17 ships anchored <coughs> close to the shore, and he brought his ships, his uh, boats, and there were, uh, there were 14 with Nelson. He brought them around here, and then he split them up into two. He had some going up one side of the French ships, and others going up the other side, and of course they were cannonading as they went. Uh, you know, it wasn't very comfortable for the French ships. And of those, uh, of those 17 ships, uh, most of them were destroyed. All but four French ships were destroyed, or surrendered uh, to Nelson in the Battle of the Nile. So that made history. And of course, the British were very, very happy with uh, the results of that because it locked Napoleon and his 30,000 strong French army in Egypt. They couldn't get out. There was no way that they could return to France, no way that they could supply that army. And so N Napoleon decided that that wasn't a, a very good situation to be in. So he got onto a ship and they, they in, in the night, they got through the, the, the English uh, line and he went back to, uh, to France, waving to his 30,000 troops and saying, well, look, have a good time, fellows, but I'm going home. And he let them then look after themselves. Now, the next major battle that was fought, which is the one in which Nelson died, was the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, the Battle of Trafalgar has gone down in history as being one of the greatest naval conflicts and victories of all time. At the time of the, of the Battle of Trafalgar, something very significant was happening in Europe. Napoleon, of course, in 1805, was, he was victorious in Europe. He had full control of France, he had full control of most of Europe by that time. He was fighting with the Austrians in the east, and he decided that it was time to subdue this pesky little country called England. So this island, this island state over here was causing him huge headaches. And so he amassed an enormous army over at Bologna on the French coast in preparation to cross over and invade England. And they were building massive quantities of barges, flat bottom barges and the like. But that was no good without the protection of the Navy because the one thing the British had was a very strong Navy. And so Napoleon demanded that his Admiral uh, bring both the French and the Spanish Navy up here into the, uh, uh, into the channel to support his crossing of the channel to invade England. But the French Admiral was uh, very timid, in fact, some suggest he was a coward. But of course, he was, he was more than that. He was, he was just simply realistic. He knew he could not defeat the British Navy, especially with Nelson at its head. And so he decided that it, it, was, uh, you know, it was politic uh, to sort of uh, fend off the demands of his leader, Napoleon, and just stay in port. And that's what they did. Now, there was a little bit of a chase that went on there was uh, some of the French fleet was, was here uh, in this bay here near Corsica, which is where Napoleon came from. And the British Navy was also in, uh, in numbers in the Mediterranean. And there was this pursuit. The, the British pursued a portion of the French fleet uh, from here, right across to the West Indies, and then all the way back. <coughs> and then the, the French fleet took, took shelter in the port of Cadiz. Now, it was off Cadiz in uh, modern uh, uh, Portugal, 
uh, that the Battle of Trafalgar was for. Portugal? No, Spain. Right down here, this is, the, this is the area of the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, this battle, as I said, has gone down in history for a number of reasons. It was, uh, it was a battle that was fought using the, the uh, facilities of the day. Now, they didn't have radio in those days. You couldn't get onto a satellite telephone and sort of ring up your admiral and say, look, I want you to move your ships here or there. They had to go on what they could see through their eyes or through a telescope. And so what Nelson did is that having locked the French and Spanish fleet in the port of Cadiz, he decided that he would have smaller ships and then frigates and then larger ships right out some 50-odd some, uh, miles, 80 kilometres in Australian terms, 50-odd miles offshore so that he could actually get signals. So that the little boats up close to the Cadiz port were, were using their telescopes and watching what was happening and any movement of the, of the fleet from the harbour, they would then signal to the ships a bit further out, who would then signal the ships further out, and so the message got back to Nelson. That was critical in fighting the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, I happened to be in England in 2005 as they were making preparations for the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar, and I went, uh, taken there by Alan and Janet Clark, went to Portsmouth, and went on to the Victory. This is the, the ship that, that Nelson used as his flagship. Uh, I went to the place where he died on board that ship. So it was a very, uh, it was in, in a way, a moving experience because I'd just been doing a lot of work on the history of this period. And, and one could actually feel, you could almost feel that you were actually, well, you were, you're walking on history. You're touching history. Not just any history, our history, biblical history. This is what shaped our world as we see it today. This is what was shaping the world as we will see it tomorrow. And you and I are going to be involved in that, in the leadership of that world. So this is very, very important stuff for Christadelphians. So the, the message was sent out by the, the ships, the little boats closer to Cadiz, that there was movement in the port. The French and the Spanish fleets were about to leave. And so they signalled. Now in those days, you had to run up flags on the mast to signal. They had all sorts of flags, and they knew what each one meant, of course. You'd run up a flag, this meant whatever, and another one meant something else. And so the message was passed <laughs> on that way. And so what happened here was that, that uh, Napoleon's fleet were given orders uh, by Napoleon. They wouldn't make the journey up around here too many English ships, and they're not going to try and fight a, a battle in the open ocean. They were planning to come out of Cadiz and to take troops, much needed troops, through, through here, uh, past Gibraltar, to Italy, where the British were making life pretty hard for the French forces. Now, Napoleon had most of the French forces, of course, up on the, on the coast of France, waiting to invade England. And so this was their plan. It didn't happen that way because uh, uh, things didn't quite go to plan. Now, the Battle of Trafalgar was fought this way. The French fleet came out. Nelson got the news that they were moving. And before they got around to start making their way down the coast, he, got, he took all of his ships and he raced towards the entrance to the Mediterranean. And he was going to cut them off and fight a battle with them down here at the entrance of the Mediterranean. But the French, of course, got wind of this. They could see what he was doing. They could see his ships, and they decided, well, we've got to get back to Cadiz. So they did a U-turn. <laughs> and they went back, they were trying to get back to the... The problem is that the wind was going in this direction, and they had to head, head virtually due north. So Nelson, he turned his fleet around, and he came back, tacking into the wind, made better ground than them and got north of them. Now that was critical in the outcome of this battle. Now the outcome of course was horrendous as we're going to see for the French and the Spanish fleet because uh, of the of the uh, 20 something ships that they brought out uh, most of them were destroyed. Now let's just get a little bit closer to what happened on that day. These are the events uh, of the uh, 21st of October, 1805. 
The red ships that you can see here, they are the French and Spanish fleet. But you can notice they're not ships of the line anymore. Do you notice that? So what's happened here? Well, you see the wind direction is in this direction. They're trying to tack up northwards to go back to Cadiz and they're being scattered. So they've lost their line and Nelson knows this and he's kept his ships in line and he's got the advantage of the wind pushing him at speed towards this lumbering, slow French and Spanish fleet. And of course he punches into them in the middle of the fleet. And what happens here, of course, is that they punch in, they break through the line of the French and Spanish ships <coughs> and start cleaning them up uh, one by one, encircling them and smashing them to pieces. Now that there is a painting of how it looked. Here is the, uh, here is the, uh, the French and Spanish fleet lumbering northwards and here you've got Nelson bringing in, in two lines, Nelson and Collingwood coming in in two lines uh, to, to bust up this fleet. It was an absolute <coughs> disaster. Now, you might say to me, well, that's all very nice, that's very interesting history, but what's that got to do with Revelation 16? Well, it's got a lot to do with it. Have a look at Revelation chapter 16. Let's read from verse 1. <coughs> Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God, upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. This is the beginning of the French Revolution in 1789. It was, of course, judgments upon the Catholic system for the treatment that they had dished out to our people, to our brothers and sisters, and any other opposition that came their way. It was God's judgments. You know, we sometimes think about God's judgments being delayed. Forget it, brothers and sisters. God began his judgments on the Catholic system in 1789. That's when he began. When the work of these angels, the seven angels began, the judgments of God were being poured out. Now, there's been pauses. There's been periods where apparently nothing's happening. But God hasn't stopped that work. It is ongoing today. The sixth pile is still being poured out. And Armageddon, the gathering of the nations to Armageddon, is a sixth vile event. You've only got to read Revelation 16, verse 16 to find that out. Because it's not till verse 17 that the seventh angel pours out his vial. You know who that seventh angel is? You and me. If, if we're there with Christ as immortals, that seventh angel is you and me. So we're the ones who are going to finish this judgment off. But never get the idea that God is, hasn't judged that system. He's already started that judgment. It's been ongoing. And he's, got, he's going to finish it off with you and me. So here we've got a very important work. It was done by angels manipulating the affairs <coughs> and the circumstances of mankind. It will be finished by saints who will pour out directly divine judgment upon this earth and upon the system Babylon the Great, which meets its end here at the end of chapter 16. So that's the first vial the wrath of God. As I said, we're going to focus on the second to the fifth. And we meet the second in verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Now this is a prophecy about the work of the British. The British domination of the sea. Now why did the British use their, their maritime domination against the French? Well because they were at war with the French. The French Revolution of course ejected the monarchy of France and the British said, oh, no, you can't do that. We're a monarchy, you can't eject the monarchy. So they were at war with the revolution. And then of course when Napoleon comes along and he's at war with Austria and Russia and, and Britain, <coughs> the British decide, well, we've got the clout on the ocean. Why don't we use that? And they did. And what they did is that they effectively stopped French trade in the Mediterranean 
And in the Atlantic area, the French could not trade anymore because the British dominated the sea. That was a judgment upon the Catholic system, effectively upon the Catholic system, as we're going to see. So here we've got the British involved in these divine judgments. They played a very important part. And more important than that was the fact that the British hemmed Napoleon in and forced him to do things that he might not otherwise have done. And that way, he turned his attention against the Catholic system and against the Holy Roman Empire, which is exactly why God put him there. To, to overthrow the Holy Roman Empire. And he brought it to an end in 1808. So brothers and sisters, when you read verse 3 of Revelation 16, you're actually reading about the history that we've just been talking about, this history of Nelson's victories against the forces of France and Spain. Now, you can see this wasn't a very comfortable place to be. Now, it says here that the sea became as the blood of a dead man. Now, a dead man doesn't have any circulation. And so its primary reference is to the stopping of trade. So there was no trade. There's no blood, as it were, going around the body politic of France because they can't get ships to shore. That's its primary meaning. But it also, I think, has a literal meaning as well. Because when you have a look at a picture like this, now I'm not sure, in fact, you can't really see it, but on the actual picture, the water is red. And there are reports that the water ran red that day. The sea became blood on the 21st of October 1805. And as you can see from the figures up here, the French and the Spanish lost 4,408 dead, 2,545 wounded. And how many men do you think they had on each of these ships? A couple of hundred? So they lost a lot of them. The British <laughs> lost 449 dead and 1,241 wounded in this conflict. It was a massacre, carnage on the sea. And so Bible prophecy, I believe, was fulfilled both in its uh, symbolic sense and also in its literal sense on this day. Well, of course, Nelson wasn't to survive this conflict. He was shot by a French sniper who was up at the top of a mast of one of these ships and they came up alongside. Nelson, of course, refused to go below. His men insisted that he take cover. He wouldn't do that. He'd already lost an arm, had been blown off by a cannon. He'd lost an eye, which had been, you know, shot through, whatever. So he, he was given to standing in, in, the, in the open. And it, it, it brought about his death. So this sniper shot him from above uh, and uh, he, uh, he collapsed to the deck. Uh, before the battle, he had signalled the fleet with the message, England expects that every man will do his duty, and he did his. He wasn't going to cower below deck. He stood out in the open, and of course, God intended that this man should go no further. Here he is, he's collapsed on the ground, as you can see, in the blue coat there, with the arrow pointing at him. And then they took him downstairs to one of the lower decks, as they were taking him down, of course, there were many other wounded men that, were, that, that needed treatment. And by the way, I've seen the instruments they used to treat them. You know, they used to saw the legs off without any sort of, uh, uh, you know, dulling of the senses. They would saw legs and arms off with these saws I wouldn't even use to cut wood. And other instruments that, you know, well, I wouldn't even use it to gut a fowl, leave alone, leave alone uh, try and fix up a man. But anyway, as he was going down, being taken down, he had to cover his face with a handkerchief because he didn't want to be recognised. Because he knew that the men would insist that, that he go first. He wanted, he wanted other men to go before him. And, and when they saw that it was Nelson, they said, look, you go, you go. So they put him at the head of the queue to go downstairs to the doctors, if you could call them that. Well, butchers is more likely what they were. <laughs> But then when he got down there, of course, he died, and this is the spot I was talking about. You can go there today on the big tree and stand. Well, I, mean, well, I can't stand there because the ceiling is about here, so you've, you've sort of got to go like this. But you can, you can actually be there on the spot where, where Nelson died. He was 47 when he died. He was taken out of the way because God had finished with this man. He had been an effective instrument to fulfill Bible prophecy. Now that that was fulfilled, no need for him anymore. So he's removed from the scene. 
Here's the, the victory. This is a photo I took in, in, uh, in 2005. They had been restoring it, of course. They've spent squillions on this ship because of their history. The British are a bit like that. I won't say anything about the Americans. They never spent anything on their history. <laughs> of course. Now, let's turn to our attention to Napoleon. As I said, this man should never have been the leader of France. He was born, as you can see on the screen, he was born in Corsica. He, he was uh, born on the 15th of August, 1769. <coughs> Question, just to see if you're awake. How old was Napoleon at the outbreak of the French Revolution? 20. 20. 20 years old at the outbreak of the French Revolution. And he wasn't there. He was on Corsica when the French Revolution broke out. Any, anyone here have been to Corsica? Of course you haven't been to Corsica. <laughs> Nobody goes to Corsica. It's that insignificant. So how come this man who becomes the emperor of the French within 10 years of the overthrow of the monarchy in France, and that's what the French Revolution was all about, <laughs> overthrowing the monarchy, how come he can build another, effectively, a monarchy, a monarchy and become an emperor of an empire within 10 years of the French Revolution, and he's a Corsican who can't speak good French? Now, that's like having someone from Cuba become the President of the United States of America in, in five or, or ten years' time. And someone from Cuba, you reckon that could happen? No. Not unless God wanted it to happen. That's why this man survived all of the hardships he went through to get there. That's why the bullets missed. You know, most of the men that stood around him in the early battles that he fought were riddled with bullets. And he was sitting on a horse for most of the time. I mean, he was a really good target. Not one bullet hit him. How come? Is this man some kind of concrete? No. The angels made sure the bullets didn't harm him. Because God had a purpose with this man. He knew his character. He knew his ego. He knew his abilities. It doesn't matter he comes from Corsica that he can't speak good French. He's going to use him for his purpose. And that's what God does. Now he was here in Corsica, which of course at the time belonged to the French, but the Corsicans hated the French with a passion. So they weren't on good terms anyway. Early in life, he was anti-French, but he later fell in with the Directory after the end of the Reign of Terror in 1794. And we'll see the way that happened in a moment. He began his career as an artillery officer fighting the British in Italy, and it was there that he made his name in the capture of Toulon. The, the, uh, Toulon was controlled by the British, or at least the port was controlled by the British, and he arranged as a 20-something-year-old, 25-year-old, to capture that port from the British, and for that, of course, he was, he was rewarded. His rise to power is quite significant. I'm just going to give you a summary of it now. After the reign of terror, ended in 1794, Napoleon tried to stay above the turmoil of French politics, it was pretty hard, and in 1795 he was invited by the Directory to suppress a number of internal revolts that were being stirred up by the Royalists. They wanted to see the monarchy come back, you see, and so there, was, there were these mini revolts going on in Paris. And so they said to Napoleon, you're a good artillery man, perhaps you can help us out. He said, not a problem. He said, a whiff of grape shot will put down any revolt, and that's what he gave them, grape shot, fought out of a cannon. However, later on, his success on the Italian front in, in 1796 uh, marked him out for future leadership. He created, and this is incredible when you think about it, he's 26, 27 years of age, he created the, what they called the Cispaldine Republic in Italy, when he defeated the Austrians there in uh, 27 battles that he won. He declared himself president of the Cispadane Republic in October 1797 as a 27 year old. <coughs> now, none of the French general, none of the French leaders had the diplomacy 
uh, and the political skill of Napoleon, quite apart from his military skill. So he had this rare combination of military tactical ability added to the skill of diplomacy and political manipulation. And when you put those things together, you have got someone who's going to go places. Now, God knew all that. He knew what he was dealing with. And so he guides this man. In 1799, Napoleon formed an alliance with some of the leading politicians of France and overthrew the present leaders of France. They called themselves the Directory. Well, they didn't know where they were going, so I'm not sure that you want to use that Directory. <laughs> he became first consul of the new governing body called the Consulate, aged 30. Now, when you put someone in the first consul position, he means, it means he's a dictator. And that's effectively what he was. There were three consuls, but he was the first among equals. It's like the Pope, you know. Nobody questions the Pope. He's the first among equals. It means he's the dictator. And that's what Napoleon was. He was at the top of the tree. Now, this man's... Uh, his ability in warfare, of course, is, uh, is legendary. In March 1796, when he's 27 years of age, he became general of the army of Italy... 26 or thereabouts, Napoleon fought seven campaigns against the Austrians who were, that was the Holy Roman Empire. This was the greatest power in Europe. They had, they had millions of people they could call upon to support them and to, and, and to augment their army. The French were a ragtag bunch. Especially when he arrived at Toulon, the French army, they didn't have shoes, they had to eat their horses because there was no food they had no horses, army without horses in those days, not great. Okay. He got there, he's 26, he organises them, and he, he says to the men, you follow me and I'll give you not only glory, but I'll give you wealth. And, you know, three million, three million Frenchmen lost their lives following Napoleon. And in his last battle, the Battle of Waterloo, which of course we get the saying from, that he met his Waterloo in that battle, which by the way he came close to winning, but it wasn't God's purpose that he win. In that battle, when it was clear at the end of the day that they were going to lose, and Napoleon decided to do something he didn't normally do, and that's run away, retreat, his men pleaded with him to stay. And they said, We know we're going to die, but we want you to stay. Now that's dedication, isn't it? Three million men lost their lives following this charismatic general who became the emperor of the French. Why would they do that? Well, because he must have had something about him that made men attracted to him and were following him. I mean, he came back from Elba in 1815, having been banished there, and the army was sent out, and there was a king on the throne in France again. And the king sent the army out. And Napoleon meets the army on the road and he talks to them and they all come behind him. It's a little bit like Jehu, isn't it? When Jehu comes and the messengers come out from the king, get behind me. And they did. They got behind him and they followed him back to Paris and he became emperor again. This is incredible charisma in this man. Well, God used it for his purpose. He fought these seven campaigns against the Austrians between 1796 and 1800. He won 26 battles in the two years, 1796 and 1797 alone. Now let's just have a quick review of that, if I can sort of get out of the way. What we've got here, right, first of all, just have a look at what the scripture says about this. Verse 4 of Revelation 16. Verse 4 says this. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now that prophecy is fulfilled. In this period of 1796 and 1797, this is the area of the rivers and fountains of waters. Nearly all of the great rivers of Europe, the Rhone, the Rhine, the Danube, and the Po, rise in this region and are fed by the melting snows of the Alps. This is the Alpine region, as you know. And, of course, there's a lot of lakes here. I might just move this cup out of the way. There are hundreds of lakes 
in this area. So this is the region prescribed here in Revelation 16 verse 4. The third angel pours out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters and they became blood. Now why would this area be focused on, do you think, in God's judgments? Well, brothers and sisters, this was the primary area where those who opposed the Catholic system, including, most likely, those that we would call our brethren, those who held the truth in that time, they weren't numerous, but they were there. This is the area where they resided, and this is where they were persecuted. This is where blood flowed. When the Catholics were dominant from the 12th century onwards, this is where they went, and they cleaned up literally thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people who stood up against them. So when God comes to pour out the third vial of his wrath, it's on this ridge. And this is the area where Napoleon spent two years fighting battle after battle. So he starts down here at Toulon. He fights a campaign in March 1796 <coughs> against the Austrians. Now the Austrians thought this was going to be a cakewalk. Not a problem. Who is this piddling little... He was... He's only five foot one or something, Napoleon. <laughs> who is this? Who is this shrimp? This twenty-six year old shrimp from Corsica who can't even get his his mouth around French words. Who is he? Who does he think he is? Standing up against the might of the Holy Roman Empire with battalion after battalion of blue-coated grenadiers. Come on, he's got no show. Guess what? He wiped them off the battlefield 26 <laughs> times in two years until they went home with a tail between their legs. And he began down here in the Piedmont, in the place where persecution against our brothers and sisters went on. And he chased them up here. The, the, the Austrians were chased up into the mountains and they found refuge. And then he beat them there. Then he pushed them. He went into Austria. I mean, he's on their own territory now. He's He's inside their territory and he's beating them there. Battle after battle. I mean, he, he didn't play the game fair, the Austrians said. This is not what war should be fought. You know, in those days they used to have, they fought the American Independence War like this too. And the Civil War, by the way. You know, they put phalanxes of men with, with guns. You know, these old musket guns. And they'd stand there 50 paces from each other and go, kaboom. And of course they'd fall like 10 pins. And the next one would come up, kaboom. And over they go. It's a little bit like the battle that was fought, wasn't it? Between David's men, Joab's men and Abner's men, where the 12 <coughs> grabbed each other and stabbed each other. They're all dead. It was that kind of battle. Well, not Napoleon. He would have an army there, and they would, the opposition would think, well, he's going to fight us, you know, this is going to be a regular standard battle. And he'd send most of his forces around the back of them, in a circle, cut off their lines of supply. This is not fair, you can't do this. Well, it's war. And he brought a new kind of warfare into existence. A little bit like Blitzkrieg. And could I remind you, there was another man who stood with his forces on the French coast at Calais in 1940, ready to invade England with flat bottom barges. And you know what saved England that time? A few men flying Spitfires and Hurricanes. Some of them from Australia. And they beat the might of the Luftwaffe. And Hermann Goring had egg on his face because he said to Hitler, that he would take two weeks and he'd have, he'd, he'd have the British on their knees. Well, you see, God stopped Napoleon from invading England in 1805. And he stopped Hitler from invading England in 1940. Because it wasn't his purpose that England be overthrown. England is Tarshish. They have to become and, and remain strong in the maritime area. And that's where they are, still relatively strong. Anyway, what happens is that there are successive battles for all over this section of Lombardy, as they used to call it, here in the, in the rivers and the fountains of waters of northern Italy. 
Some of them down here, you can see battles down here over near Antipoda, which is on the eastern coast of Italy, and uh, Ravenna. Ravenna was a place where the popes used to have some, uh, some power at one point. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because you see, when you come to verse 6 of Revelation 16, it says this, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and they did that up in the fountains and rivers of waters. They've shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. And that's what God gave the Pope to drink. He gave him blood to drink. Because the Pope decided that if the Austrians could defeat this skinny little Corsican, then the Pope would beat him. So he gathered an army. He, he, he got a lot of... He got a, a, really just a rabble. He gathered an army of fanatical peasants and he attacked the French, thinking he could defeat Napoleon. He was defeated at Faenza and Ancona, and with Napoleon advancing on Rome, the Pope did the only thing he could, he sued for peace. The conditions that were laid upon him were huge. An enormous cost in money, and under utterly humiliating terms, a treaty was signed between Napoleon and the Pope. The papacy and his adherents drank blood for the first time, but worse was to come in the fifth vile judgments that were to follow. Now this is why God put Napoleon there. It was to bring judgment upon the two horns of the beast of the earth of Revelation chapter 13. Now you know who the beast of the earth is. It's the Holy Roman Empire. It's got two horns. It's got a papal horn and it's got an emperor horn. And the judgments that God is bringing here were upon that Holy Roman Empire. So the judgments had to be against Pope and Emperor. And this is where the Pope begins to suffer the consequences of his folly and, of course, of the persecution of his opposition for centuries prior to that. Now, the final phase of the third vial is very interesting. After his triumph in Italy, Napoleon looked for new conquests and decided on Egypt. That was the events of 1798. Remember the Battle of the Nile, which disturbed his objective? Though militarily successful, the campaign was a disaster due to British intervention, their supremacy on the sea. In Napoleon's absence, the Austrians, with help from Russia, had retaken Italy with huge losses on both sides. And, of course, we said that Napoleon forsook his army in Egypt and returned to Paris, where, by turn of events, he became first consul after the coup of 1799. He was 30 years of age when these events occurred. Now, there was, a, there was uproar uh, in the directory on November the 9th and 10th, 1799, when, I, when Napoleon and his two compatriots overthrew the directory and became the consular, he being the first consul. It was a, a pretty near thing, by the way. He almost messed that one up. His diplomacy <coughs> seemed to, to, uh, to escape him at that time. <laughs> However, he, as soon as he became ruler of France, he gathered an army, he crossed the Alps and retook Italy from the Austrians in the campaign of 1800. Now, to do this, this is where he was riding on a mule. Remember that? And they painted him on a white horse. To do that, he had to cross the Alps at the end of winter. That's a no-no. You don't do that in summer with an army of 60,000 men. And they said, the people of that day said, you can't do this. You cannot take an army of men on foot with mules uh, pulling cannon and supplies across the Alps at the end of winter. That is utter stupidity. <laughs> he did it in a couple of weeks. He was over. And, and they still marvel at that. How did this man do this? What, what sort of commitment did the men have to make who followed him to push cannons over the Alps? You haven't the Alps? Come <laughs> on. This, this is abseiling stuff. This is, not, this is not, you know, a walk in the park. You need to almost abseil this, this area to get across. He left Geneva on the 8th of May and he arrived unopposed at Milan on the 2nd of June, 1800. Milan's down on the plain, on the south of the Alps. The Austrians were defeated at the Battle of Montebello and then again decisively at Marengo on the 14th of June, although that one could have gone another way. It was only near the end of the day that the Austrian general got too confident and he made a mistake and Napoleon saw it, and he was in retreat. 
he said, now it's time to go back. And they turned on the Austrians and defeated them decisively on that day. It's gone down in history as one of the greatest battles of all time, the Battle of Marengo. The Austrians suffered immense losses and withdrew, leaving Italy to Napoleon. And France and Austria signed the Treaty of Lundville in France on the 8th of January 1801. And that brought four years of peace. Now, in that period of time, Napoleon set about completely rewriting the rule book in France and effectively in Europe and, might I say, in the world. We in Australia today are governed by rules that Napoleon established in the Napoleonic Code. We even use the metric system. Now, you Americans are sensible people. You stay, <laughs> even though you dislike the British, well, okay. you, you, as a nation, disliked the British and you fought them to get your independence. You kept the imperial system, okay? Whereas we've gone the French way in Australia and so have the Canadians, okay? So this man laid down in the Napoleonic Code the rules and the basis for judging in courts and, and for governing way back then. And he was, they say he was probably a century in front of where humanity should have been in terms of some of the things that he wrote in that code. Incredible fellow. And he used to sleep two or three hours a night, this gentleman. Two or three hours a night. Come on, brethren, hands up. Can you survive on two or three hours? Okay? Why didn't he sleep? Because he was too busy. He wasn't fighting wars in this period. He was just too busy preparing the Napoleonic Code and ruling and governing. He was a one-man band, effectively. However, the time came when he wanted to make sure that everybody knew it. And so on the 2nd of December, 1804, he crowned himself Emperor of the French in the presence of the Pope. He invited the Pope to come up to Paris. He sat him down in the Catholic Cathedral the, uh, the, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, that's you know, obvi obviously got to do with Mary. Notre Dame, you sat him down there, and you, you, know, you imagine if you were the Pope, you're thinking, oh, oh good oh, I'm going to crown Napoleon. <laughs> He's going to have to defer to me. I'm going to take. Sorry, Mr. Pope. That's not what happened. He claimed that this Republican monarchy that he was establishing, in which he would be the emperor, was different to the old order. It wasn't really, it was, it was a monarchy. So here's the painting of uh, the French painter, painted by Jacques Louis David, all right, of the crowning of Napoleon in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. Now, can we pick <coughs> out the Pope here? Can you see the Pope? Here he is, with the scepter in his hand. Can you see Napoleon? Here he is. What's he got in his hands? Well, he's got the crown. And he puts it on his own head after crowning Josephine, his wife, as the Empress. So he crowns himself in the presence of the Pope. It's like spitting in the Pope's face. That's yeah. what he's effectively doing. On crowning himself Emperor in December 1804, he said this, I am the instrument of providence. She will use me as long as I accomplish her designs. Then she will break me as a glass. That's exactly what happened. While he stuck to his divinely ordained task, he had great success. When he stepped off that path, everything failed. Now, 1812 is the classic example of that. Did God raise up Napoleon to overthrow the Russians? No. He raised up Christ to do that job. So what's he doing gathering an army of 600,000 men and going off to, to Russia <coughs> just before winter? There's another man who made that mistake too, didn't he? His name was Hitler. He took massive forces into Russia in 1941, 42. Did he succeed? No. He didn't learn from history either, did he? So here we've got Napoleon going off on this venture. God did not raise him up to attack Russia. He raised him up to destroy the Holy Roman Empire. While he stuck to that, nobody beat him. When he got off that path, the wheel fell off. I am the instrument of providence. She will use me as long as I accomplish her designs. Now, he's got this gender wrong. 
this is not her designs. This is his designs with a capital H. <coughs> Yahweh's designs. Then she will break me as a glass. He dies at 51 years of age. He'd been retired for five years. In other words, his career ended at age 46. Hands up, brethren, if you'd like to retire at 46. Most of us, of course, would be in that category, wouldn't we? Well, he got to retire at 46, not to a place that he wanted to retire, St. Helena. But anyway, that's what happened. So here we've got his work. This was the Empire of Charlemagne in 814. This is the Holy Roman Empire. It had an imperial horn and it had a papal horn. Papal horn from Rome, the imperial horn was based in Austria, Vienna at the time. And so the judgments had to come upon the Austrians, which was his principal enemy, and upon the Pope, who he of course <coughs> abolished to in basically imprisonment in 1809. And so he, he kicked the Pope out of the Vatican and took him up just south of France, uh, where he was imprisoned for several years. So that was the work of Napoleon, to, to destroy, to bring to an end the power of the two horns of the beast of the earth of Revelation chapter 13. Now, a very quick summary, because the time is getting away from us, a very quick summary of his major victories. Marengo, 14th of June, 1800, Orm. Now, the Battle of Orm was fought on the way back from the French coast, remember? He went there in summertime, couldn't invade England, got to almost winter time, he had to do something with the army, so he brought them east to, to uh, fight the Austrians. He beat them at all in Germany, and then in Austerlitz, of course, which is uh, in Czechoslovakia of today, he had victories at Jena in uh, October 1806, Friedland in 1807, Walbrook in 1809, and Luzern in 1813. And in between that, of course, was the disaster of the Russian campaign in 1812. Now, I want to just talk very briefly about the Battle of Austerlitz. <coughs> Anyone been to Paris here? Anyone been to Paris? No one puts a hand up. Oh, we've got one. Now, you will have been to the Arc de Triomphe, yeah, on the Champagne Elysee. Is my French as good as Napoleon's? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> now, now, the Arc de Triomphe was built to celebrate his victory at the Battle of Austerlitz on the 2nd of December, 1805, anniversary day from the day he was crowned by himself as Emperor of France, which is why his men fought so hard at the Battle of Austerlitz. Now this battle was the battle in which men were scorched with fire. I want you to read Revelation chapter 16 and verse 10. Sorry, verse 9. And men, let's just step back to verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, which of course is the government of the Holy Roman Empire, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which had power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. What's that all about? Well, Alexander I, the Russian emperor, made this statement after the Battle of Austerlitz. He said, that is true. He is a great warrior, speaking about Napoleon. As to myself, this is the first time I have seen fire. I never presumed to compare myself with him, he said. He was to make another statement you'll see in a moment. Now, the Battle of Austerlitz was, as I said, the greatest battle that he ever fought tactically. He had held what is called the Pratzen Heights. Now, just get your bearings here. This is Austerlitz over here. The battle is named after that little town. And here's the town of Brun. That's quite a prominent town in Czechoslovakia today. It was a town in which there was a hospital and so on. So men who were wounded could be taken there. Here is a, a, a hill, this is the, this is the Prats and Heights, they call it, this hill here. There's another hill over here. Now all of these little hills were to play their part. Originally, Napoleon had hurled the Prats and Heights. Now in those days you did not give up high ground in battles, but he did. About the uh, late November, he decided to come down off the Prats and Heights and he gathered his forces and he made out as though he was going to retreat. I mean, it was cold. His men had been, had been clothed for summer fighting. They didn't have proper shoes. This is the 1st of December, 1st and 2nd of December. Does it get cold here, the 1st of December? Well, it certainly gets cold in Europe. And so 
His men were not prepared. And of course, the Russians, who had come along to support the Austrians, had 100,000 well-equipped men, well-trained men as well. So they thought, we're going to win this one. This is not a problem. And when he, when he vacated the Pratts and Heights, they said, he's got to be an idiot. So they then put all of their major forces up on the heights here. Napoleon, meanwhile, was organising his army over here. He had 66,000 men, most of them uh, uh, ill-equipped. However, what he did was to put a reserve over here behind this hill, quite a strong reserve, hidden out of sight of the Austrians and the Russians. And he made his, his right flank very thin. So that when they're looking down from the heights of them, why is that flank so thin? That's the obvious place to drive a chariot through, which of course is what they tried to do. So what happened was that the, the Austrians and the Russians attacked the weak right flank of Napoleon. It was a trap. He had planned all of this. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He then punched up the preps and heights again. He retook them, with great losses by the way, but he retook the heights and then he sent the bulk of his army around behind the Russians and the Austrians and he trapped them down here in front of this hill. Meanwhile, of course, these troops who'd been held in reserve came around and they encircled a massive army, something like 60,000 men. And most of them got chopped up. They were trapped down here. And this is what was reported in the Times. Now, the Times was a newspaper, still a newspaper. It was being printed back then, and it was reported of the carnage of the Battle of Austerlitz. Of 80,000 Russians, 40,000 no longer exist. The rest, without artillery or baggage and surrounded by the French army, could only be saved by an armistice. This corps was driven from position to position, and we saw the horrid sight of 20,000 men throwing themselves into the water, nearly freezing water, and drowning themselves in the lake. They were utterly routed. The Russians had supported Austria against Napoleon to prop up the failing Holy Roman Empire and that's why God gave Napoleon the victory because this was effectively against that empire. And of course it wasn't too long after that that Francis I, the last emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, <coughs> dissolved the empire in 1806. He was forced to do that in August of that year. And he became Francis I of Austria. But, did you see what it said there at the end? of verse 9 they repented not to give him glory you think that these judgments against this catholic system actually achieved anything in them no you see what it says again at the end of verse 11 they blasphemed the god of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds no when they defeated napoleon in 1815 francis recovered most of the territory he had lost and the pope went back into the vatican and it all went back to what it was before, except that the Holy Roman Empire was no longer in existence. That's what was achieved, and that's why God sent him. And the judgments and the torment that he brought upon them were, of course, designed for that purpose. So he built, or at least he began to build the Arc de Triomphe. It wasn't actually finished until 1830. He died in 1821. So it was based, this Arc de Triomphe, on the Arch of Constantine. Now, he wasn't pretentious at all, Napoleon. So when he had the architects to design the, the Arc de Triomphe, you can see that they clearly used the design of the Arch of Constantine, which of course you can see outside the Colosseum today in central Italy. Now I'm not going to talk about the Battle of Wagram, which was awful in its prospect, but we'll come to the end of his life. He was defeated by the Allies in May 1814, banished to the island of Elba, where he was emperor, he escaped in February 1815, returned to France where he returned to power for a hundred days, <coughs> temporarily deposing Louis XVIII to the restored Bourbon monarch. He regathered the French army and met the Allies, Britain, Austria, Prussia and, uh, and Russia at Waterloo where he was defeated <coughs> on the 18th of June 1815 and was exiled to the remote Atlantic island of St Helena and died there in 1821. So when you look at this man's achievements, he won numerous battles while he was focusing on his mission. When he went to Russia, everything came unstuck. Even after the disaster, he won battles in Central Europe. Why? Because this was against the heartland of Catholicism. He ends up on Elba, and then, of course, defeated at Waterloo 
in 1815, a battle which, which was a very close thing. And as he fled, as I said, the soldiers pleaded with him not to go. But his time had come, and at 46, he goes off into captivity to St. Helena. One final thing. The message that came from Alexander I, the Russian emperor to Napoleon after the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. Tell your master, said this prince, that I shall retire, that yesterday he has performed miracles, and that my astonishment respecting him has increased, that he is some chosen instrument of heaven, and that it will require a century to make my army equal to his. What about Napoleon's estimation of how he won his victories? The hand of God leads my armies, he said. And the time had come for providence to break him as a glass. The instrument of heaven had effected its work. And brothers and sisters, we can be very thankful to our God that it was so. Because what was done by these instruments of heaven Nelson and Napoleon has shaped the world we live in today and that has shaped the events that we look for with great anticipation the coming of the end of the sixth fall and we are just a hair's breadth away from it and it won't be long and he, the sixth angel, will gather them. These nations will be brought by the work of the spirits, the unclean spirits like frogs, they'll be brought to Armageddon into the land of Israel. And you and I will be there to meet them and to pour out the seventh vial of the wrath of God. If God could use Napoleon and Nelson, do you reckon he can use you and me? I reckon he can. Providing we hold on until the day comes. That's our message. Because the seven thunder judgments, which start with the seventh vial, is your work, my work.